In the first session, we had an introduction to TD research approaches. Today, we have the honor of having a conference about challenges and solutions for uh, the kind of scientific the science dissemination we need. Um, so we need to go beyond the academic audience. And this is one of the main challenges in our research projects because we include other stakeholders. Today, we will have an expert in the topic and we should, uh, and they are going to provide us with some tips in order to improve uh, science dissemination. Next, please. Bueno, la logística. Esta sesión será de okay. uh, dynamics. We will have a 90 minute session. We will have a Q&A session at the end. So please, any comment or question you might have, please include them in the chat. We will be making a note of these questions and comments, and then we will forward them to the presenters. The sessions are being recorded and they are posted on the website within 24 hours. The reference materials for this session will also be included in the website. Well, please remember the course website. You can, of course, access the IAI website, the BAHO website, or also the, um, you can check out the GCCHE uh, website to, you know, watch the videos or uh, watch the, read the material, or whatever you need. Please mute your mics and keep your cameras on so that everything is more dynamic and participatory. Next, please. This is today's presenter. This is Juan Manuel Sarasua. He's a science scientific journalist. He works in the States and in Latin America. He writes about biology, health, basic research, open science, science policy, science in Latin America and Europe. Uh, as of late, he has also focused on uh, communication on COVID-19 and climate change. His work in science communication involves helping researchers communicate their uh, research to non-specialized audiences. He suggests an easy way to communicate results and also he addresses he also addresses the science behind the research. He helps identify the key aspects to you know tell a story, develop a story and measure its impact. To do this, he works closely with scientists, journalists, um, marketing experts, communication experts, IT teams, journalists, uh, media producers, agencies, well, uh, really uh, several stakeholders that can help researchers uh, improve communication and help audiences uh, understand topics that actually involve us all. Well, uh, well, Juan, welcome. I don't know if you go by Juan or Juan Manuel. Juan is fine, Juan Manuel is fine as well. Great, thank you, welcome. Thank you, Maria Inés. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bajo, Colombia, the IAI, and thank you uh, all for participating. As Maria Inés has said, I've been working with scientists for many years now from our university and also outside the university because I, I try to help them uh, understand which aspects they should communicate. Um, what I will try to do today is provide an overview of the very few key aspects that a lab or scientist should consider when it comes to preparing a communication, um, be it in, in any format. But I, I believe that we need to organize ourselves first in, all, in order to communicate something. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Perfecto. Aquí esta es la presentación, la ven bien. 
Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, that's fine. Okay, let's begin now with a question that Haley will be uh, displaying on the screen. Let's take a few minutes to do this. Do you think that it's important to communicate your science to the general public? First option, number one, is yes, a lot. I always do it, even uh, those aspects we think are not worth being communicated. Two, it's important, but not, it's, it, not essential. I must do it when there is a huge discovery or valuable news. Um, or three, and this is also valid, and I think this is what actually happens in my everyday life, which has changed a lot lately. But many people believe, and this is option three, that they can live without communicating science to the general public. And, and this can be justified as well. Maybe we can wait a few minutes and you can think it over. You can also include uh, your comments in the chat and then we can uh, discuss them. This is available in English as well. Esto es un gran aliciente encontrar que hay, pues, viendo la respuesta. Well, it's great uh, to see that by looking at the answers, many people are interested in communicating several aspects of research. And there is quite a high percentage as well that uh, only important uh, results should be communicated. For instance, when I have uh, some valuable news or a valuable out, uh, result. I'm very happy that no one has selected option three because it's very discouraging uh, because I need to eat too. Uh, okay, so let's start the presentation with a question. Why is it important to communicate the science we do? I believe, we believe that it's very important to do so. And hopefully after this talk, you will be persuaded as well to do this. First of all, it's important to communicate science because it's a social responsibility. We need to explain uh, and help people understand uh, the information they read about, they, they see on television. And we also need to provide answers to the questions that uh, you have found and that people have as well. Um, and many times it's it's your job, you know, finding solutions to problems that affect many people. Uh, so that was number one, social responsibility. Uh, there is another reason which is also important, and this is mainly why the IEI is working on this, is lobbying. We need to uh, advise people um, correctly. I think uh, this is at least the case in Latin America. We need to improve, uh, you know, um, budgetary plans in order to create a decision, a political decision making process that really considers the, the scientific results and scientific research. This is like a dream, but this is why it's important to communicate science. This role of advising uh, scientists uh, is still not uh, ideal in Latin America. There is some work in this regard, but there is still a long way to go. And you're aware about, of this need. And this is why it's important for you to learn to communicate to non-scientists. I'm sorry, there's, there's someone with a mic on. Can you please mute yourself? Because um, I'm sorry about this, but it's, it's difficult to speak with a mic on. Thank you. And there's a third reason why it's important to communicate science, justifying the use of taxpayers' money. And this is one of the main reasons. This alone should be uh, a driver to boost communication in all your labs. Uh, personally, uh, or each of us knows that it's important to communicate science uh, many times to obtain funds. And um, there are several funders, and this happens a lot. They require developing communication strategies that have an impact on society or on the your research group. 
And this applies to several types of organizations, to different researchers, um, I don't know, early career researchers, postdoc people. There are several types of, of funding schemes. And this happens quite a lot. Actually, um, funders request that researchers have a communication strategy. Um, I have an example from last week, for instance. The Fondo de Patagonia was created, uh, or the Patagonia Fund, and one of the requirements was that, or is that, uh, there should be, you know, communication um, projects within the projects. Also, there is another fund. The idea is to create change and participate in the coming revolutions. And this is what they say there. The Marie Curie actions, for instance, from the Euro European uh, Union for postdoc uh, candidates, they have these requirements as well. And the Research Council also uh, includes these requirements. So maybe it's not all the funders that require communication, but, but this will be the case in five years' time. I don't want to criticize everyone, but because I know that you're all interested in disseminating information. But we must remember that this is not the general rule. And many times communicating science and research results has become, you know, summarizing your results, maybe talking to other researchers, having um, an easy, a simple blog, a Twitter account, and that's that. But that's not what, what our aim is. We would like this to be a two-way communication path. You know, that's a definition of communication. It's a two-way process. And this is possible, you know, because technology allows us to do this because users and people are demanding this, actually. They uh, require constant communication. And to do this, um, it's not enough, you know, to write a, a blog article or just, you know, have a Twitter account. I think we need to understand that we really need to pay attention to these contents and to do so to devote this some time and to do so effectively we need to know what we already have in order to communicate our science we need to understand that communicating research results or with data and academic or scientific content is not enough in order to actually have an impact on the, a larger audience. Not even uh, science policy makers uh, find this enough. Um, and this is uh, quite important when it comes to paying attention to the larger audience. It seems to be an abstract idea, but they're also part of this, of this public. This is why we need better communication strategies that will allow us to reach the society with information we have. We shouldn't be making, you know, a huge effort to communicate results we don't have. And this is very important because we need to uh, get uh, people to trust science again, because we have a, a, a context of increasing misinformation. We have an amazing technological um, uh, we have amazing technological advances now, and we can create content and publish it in a faster way, in a more faithful way, and we can have a, a lot more impact. So if we deny all this, it, it's not very intelligent, because this is a, the, the world we're living in. Things will become harder, and we need to own our own communication, so we need to know about all this. This is an avalanche, okay? We cannot... Uh, we can do nothing to stop it. And this is what we have seen in the last few years with the COVID pandemic. Last year, we had a similar course. Uh, we said that the pandemic created an IT, uh, sorry, um, a news chaos throughout the world. And in some areas, uh, people didn't trust some areas. And this was the case with science as well. Why? because uh, from one moment to the next, people became extremely interested in science. Uh, the, the audience was anxious, scared, and they, they were a captive audience, okay? And this is what fear does, actually. You're nervous all the time, and you are alert all the time. 
that uh, and that means that we are connected 24 hours a day we all needed and required constant guiding politicians you know the general public journalists decision makers other scientists okay uh, no one uh, was immune to all this we wanted information all the time and this uh, drove the demand uh, to have better and better quality and more scientific communication. It wasn't that easy, of course, to have better communication. It's very difficult to actually have good communication. Um, at the beginning, communication was um, led by journalists that were not scientific journalists, and they were not specialized, but I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying what happened. Uh, there are great examples of uh, journalists who are not uh, scientific journalists, but who did a great job anyway, and they keep doing that. And also influencers who kept working. During the pandemic, this was like, you know, fuel uh, for this fire that kept on uh, going. Scientists needed to adapt to all this, to this, you know, crazy pace of news of you know, uh, print mass media, social media. And this goes absolutely against science communication in some areas at least. Uh, some like astronomy uh, are actually very fast or IT as well. But most other sciences, health, biology, medicine, you know, communication is much slower but because you need to be careful about what you say. So non-specialized services did their best. And sometimes it went well, sometimes it didn't. And this obsession uh, about communicating the facts meant that actually understanding the facts was secondary. It was the most important thing was to, you know, to communicate the latest fact, the latest news, uh, the opinion of, uh, I don't know, some expert. And that uh, came before really understanding what people say. Uh, if we remember, if if we add to this, you know, social media uh, misinformation or fake news, and we need to check if something is true or not, you know, the system is really uh, problematic. The world needed professionals that needed to understand the the problem and they needed to know which data to share and which data not to share. This has weakened people's trust, trust in science. So we need to work a lot harder to um, actually regain people's trust. Data are not enough. So we need to know how we do this. First, we need to understand what we need to communicate. Now we will have a second question. Please take uh, a minute to answer the question. Based on your experience and your uh, field of study, what do you think is an important aspect to communicate uh, to a non-scientific audience? You can uh, choose one of the options or write more comments in the chat. If you think it's just communicating the scientific results of an investigation, or you think that what matters is to explain what your what your area is about or scientific area is about which uh, uh, what distinguishes it from other areas or if you think that we need to communicate the impact on society locally regionally or globally number four the people who did the research and the skills you communi communicate the the training where they come from what they contributed to the study as well and if you can think of something else, please write it down in the chat. Excellent. Is to too high or too low. All right, so you can see the answers here. Most people believe that what needs to be communicated is the impact it has on society, both uh, locally, regionally, and globally. And that's very interesting because we are 
crumbling down the crystal tower that apparently that supposedly scientists were in from the beginning of science hundreds of years ago where science was an elite concept and it's important that us scientists uh, scientists themselves know that we are part of reality of society and that we need to communicate it um, what we do needs to be transferred to society sometimes it's not diff it's not easy to find that impact but well that can be done over time with experience and with some things that I'm going to now describe. Let's move on. So if we have no idea on how to communicate this, perhaps in order to answer this question that we just asked of what needs to communicate, we need to pay attention to what journalists and media are doing and there we can already have an idea of what people are interested in. And given that the consequences of climate change are, um, are many and it's becoming more and more part of our daily lives, climate change is an excellent opportunity to discover new spaces and communities for journalists and media and to find out new stakeholders and new areas where we can find specialists that many people did not know about. Climate change is too vast and offers many opportunities for different um, media. And this is something that scientists haven't been able to do efficiently. For instance, they can make new solutions known, new answers, they can share new dimensions, they can also contribute within uh, accurate information to the public discourse through exact data. Y pertinentes a cada situación y lugar situation and place and adopting different formats that can be adapted to different uh, contexts around the world. So it's important that we offer this content that can be useful to scientists in this regard. Journalists can also aid scientists, which is to educate the public, the audience. And that's why the previous question was relevant on whether science, if you think that it's valuable to communicate science that you do, and this has an educational component to it that is very important, but maybe not everyone wants to be uh, um, educated on what's uh, going on in terms of science. And the last thing you can do is to drive actions. Perhaps we can have uh, disadvantaged uh, constituencies that are undergoing different uh, issues such as disabilities, well, scientists can make these realities known. They can drive actions that these communities have been doing for a long time, but which they haven't had the opportunity to make themselves visible. So this is the role that journalists and media could play if we understand that this is what they tr uh, are trying to do. Perhaps that's what we could try to, to do as well what we could offer them. So if we can identify what journalists and audiences need and are looking for, we can then create, choose the context that would adapt them to their needs better. And that is what we are looking for when we listen to what journalists and media are trying to communicate. So for this, we have three key points that would immediately help you in order to tell the story of what you're doing. So the three key issues or points here is data. We need to determine which, which aspect of research is important for the public, not for scientists themselves. We're now going to call it data. And this is very important because it will define what the audience will learn. It will also define the formats for communication and the means of communication chosen. The second key component is the local component. And we need to find a link between the social, political, economic links and needs of our audience. And that's the, the meaning of um, adapting it locally. And as many of you said, to measure the impact that we're doing in with our research, 
who is being impacted and to locate it somewhere to provide a physical setting that could be recognized. We need to find those links uh, that connect us to society. It could be geographical locations, historic locations, historical, economic, it could be social components, whatever you like. And the third key point is deciding the angle, the aspect of science that will help us to break through. And we could maybe uh, discuss it from an ethical point of view, legal point of view, social point of view, any aspect of research that will help us tell this story. So this will help people identify that uh, connection point with research. There is a, these angles might not have anything to do with research. They might just be a component that help us in communicating this investigation. If this is conducted in um, a given place, it could be communicated somewhere else, but of course it will be more relevant to where this research was conducted in. There's a fourth component or key point that most don't have access to, and that is to work uh, jointly with uh, communication specialists. If you work with universities, sometimes they have a communications department, and I advise you strongly to work alongside them so that you can find, uh, by working with uh, specialized journalists, that would be a first step in order to learn the art of writing, and they can probably give you many uh, indications on how to do this. But let's not forget that we need to attract the audience. We don't just have to educate. We can explain all the concepts, uh, but it's important that you tell things that are interesting to provide information in, in an efficient way. Remember that attention span of people does not go beyond eight seconds. Instagram has videos of 10 seconds long and the first two seconds, if you're not hooked, then the Instagram algorithm penalizes this video and will remove it. So if you're are able to maintain the audience's attention for more than 10 seconds, then the algorithm or the platform will allow this video to be more easily distributed or even more. I'm not saying that this is what you should be doing, but this is how it works in many social media platforms. And what we need to do is to attract the attention of the public and not trying to establish the absolute truth, but rather to grab the attention quickly and to use those three key points that I've just mentioned. Let's move on. Um, I'm going to provide an example of how research was put into practice with a piece of research that was conducted a few years ago. You can actually check this out. Uh, Omar De Feo is a researcher of the Marine Institute of uh, Aguas Dulces in Uruguay, and he speaks about the loss of habitats uh, due to human intervention, which is a coast stress, and that's data in itself, the stress that coasts undergo. The uh, this was conducted both in Uruguay and in Mexico, and the angle that was chosen was the economic impact that this had, but the ecological and political components were also analyzed. And towards the end, they worked with an advisor and a journalist uh, who worked alongside them, but the text itself was drafted by the scientists. And then finally, uh, it was published, the impact that it had was published in both newspapers, Tal Qual and Folia de Sao Paulo, that was written alongside a researcher that was ended up being in one of the most important newspapers in Brazil and uh, Tal Qual in Venezuela. If you manage to have a text that finds common ground with societies and that can have greater impact, then of course it will be much more successful. 
Well, what we're now interested in, probably you're interested in knowing how to communicate because we know what to communicate, but how do we communicate? And let's now have a look at the different components that should be borne in mind. And this is the most important concept. And this is something that still applies to identify the audience and define objectives. We need to identify who we are directing, who we are targeting. And within our labs, we need to decide what we want to communicate, what the objectives of these communication are. So these could be the different components that we should be looking for. As objectives, we might want to increase our funding. We might want to lobby and get more support from politicians and in public institutions, or we might want to have more availability of public monies. Um, Perhaps we want to uh, the parliaments to have better informed decisions, or we might want to combat uh, misinformation. Perhaps we want to increase the validity of science. And this all depends on who we communicate this to. And so defining and identifying the audience who is going to listen to us is very important. The, it can be decision makers, uh, private investors, and different public funding organizations. It can be the general public, can be the educational sector as well. We can also target school teachers from our region. We might want to communicate the potential changes to uh, employees or even other scientists from unrelated areas of research. Many a time, the order, well, what do we pick first, the objective or the audience? Well, sometimes this is reversed and we have to work in a reverse fashion, but this is does not really change the result. We need to work on both uh, aspects and then we'll create the link between these two. What matters is that we understand what the audience needs and that's why it's important to listen. And to listen, goes alongside speaking and communicating. We need to speak adequately. So uh, do not be afraid of choosing scientific jargon, but avoid using all the jargon that you usually use. For instance, uh, words that might be more too technical used within the lab can complicate conversations on the hallway or so sometimes uh, something that you've assimilated, but others have not, try not to do that. But feel free to mention some key words that are more technical, that are related to methods or, or similar. So our starting point is that even a lay person is not silly. And so if they have an interest on this, they will ask. You also need to make sure that what is being said is accurate. That is to say that we should think before we speak. And this is uh, the ethical component of citing the sources. It can be a text, an audio, a picture, but this is very important. And then find the angle that connects you to the audience and then work first on the content and then work on the story that will be telling this content. Be authentic, be honest, be straightforward, be simple. And of course, be aware of your weaknesses. Don't beat about the bush, don't exaggerate. You can use suspense, humor. You can use analogies that will allow the audience to be surprised and say things that most people will not know about outside a lab. Most people are not aware of what we do, trivial data or fun facts such as animals that are used within the lab. Maybe people are not aware of, the majority of people are not aware of it. So the idea is to take people to places where they haven't been before. And you can lead them somewhere where you are seen as the heroes and what could be obvious for you might not be obvious for the rest of the public. So after this, understand that a good title is very important. So 
atractivo de nuevo. Try to find a headline that will be uh, doesn't need to be perfect or directly reflect the, re the piece of research, but should be attractive. Of course, it should be linked to it, but it should uh, be be creative. And then there's a third step of taking the initiative in countries such as ours in Latin America. We have the support of institutions, and so we need to plan the tools available are scarce, and that's why we need to make sure that we find the way to get in touch with um, the regulars, such as communication departments from universities, specialized journalists that you might already know, news agencies or broadcasting centers. Usually every country has one. And so if by any chance you're part of an association or a national agency for scientific communication, get in touch with them. There's always a few uh, media communications that are more interested in science or politi politicians with a specific interest, get in touch with them. And if none of this works, then you have to take over the issue of communication and become the content creators. If what you have available in your lab is not enough, then you can create collaboration networks with other stakeholders. Uh, feel free to contact similar agencies or similar and uh, help use mutual collaboration, even though the discipline or the area of work might be different. It can be anthropologists or, science or sociologists. So this has changed the roles of researchers in communicating with the public. And perhaps what we don't need is to have big uh, dissemination projects, but rather to prepare ourselves for this communication. These are the key messages of this session, that you need to stop being the researchers in order to become a new type of researcher. So we are both senders and receptors of information. As scientists, we're always interacting with everybody and the bottleneck that sometimes existed for in uh, uh, accessing scientists has, hasn't disappeared, but it's much easier to contact a specialist uh, at a university around the world than 10 or 20 years ago. And so this is becoming easier. And digitalization of scientists is almost compulsory. This presence defines you and in a way makes it uh, a, a mechanism for validity. If it doesn't exist on the web, then it doesn't exist. You might agree or disagree, but thousand, mil, thousands of, of people and thousands of algorithms believe this. That's why it's important that you have this digital existence. You need to prepare yourselves to communicate this because communication more than ever is going both directions. So that's the advice that I'm giving you so that you can actually take on this role and do this two-way communication. First, to create communication uh, assignments within the group, who is going to be in charge of social media or the institutional email, who is in charge of providing replies to the press and participate in social media that you choose. It doesn't have to be an overwhelming participation every day, but do have a presence on social media, ask questions, update your press online presence, uh, use OSIS, uh, Google Scholar, LinkedIn might not seem relevant, but it is. And these are just to name a few. Um, and this will allow you to be more visible. Organize your content so that you have pictures of scientists uh, who are part of your lab and the different, uh, the names of the institutional logos, uh, the names, the, the positions, perhaps we can 
waste days, uh, spend days just looking for this data, but file them correctly so that you can, everybody can actually answer to these requests. For, for instance, spending days choosing, uh, knowing what someone's position is. Also invest in, um, approach the communication networks, uh, suggest different networks or people to redirect this question as scientists and experts this is very valuable and even if uh, you don't uh, have access to this it's important that you say no when you don't know an answer but if you don't you can always ask someone else or you can refer someone to answer that question but offer some kind of reply this is just kindness uh, be agile when uh, interacting with media so that you don't spend too much time. You can use WhatsApp to send messages or comments or make yourself sources of information for people. You can even reach active youngsters. Many young people use social media to communicate interesting items of data, and this is already a public that can help in uh, spreading the word so they can you can become their source of information and then invest a minimum amount in equipment to communicate they probably headsets a cell phone such as the one i'm having it's excellent to record a distant video and you can create different communication elements that you can then um, can be at be adequate and then spend some time in uh, training journalists, open your labs and media are sometimes not used to, are used to uh, working in the long run and information on climate change can become very complicated. We need time to understand certain concepts and terminology and media does not work with these times. Immediacy is uh the most important aspect and so we uh, unless it's a catastrophe or an emergency we always start with the wrong foot but if we understand that this urgency exists and we are aware of it then of course we can uh find a solution that's why these journalists who are not specialized journalists perhaps they have an interest in science you can train them you can give them advice and you can uh, they can be invited to know your reality. Then we can focus on creating contents and attractive formats. So first of all, let's pay attention to all this. And then we can, you know, think big and we can, I don't know, go National Geographic and create amazing infographics, etc. But I think that we really need to be more efficient and faster so that we can, we can then create interesting content. For instance, climate missions is a climate outreach, climate visuals is a climate outreach project created something like 15 years ago. And here you can find uh, climate related images. And uh, these are open source. Um, and free images and they have a creative commons license i think and this is you know a reliable a source of uh of images and that have been you know created for uh, journalists and scientists so you can actually uh provide work with this network or maybe if you have images maybe you can create your own photo gallery on Flickr flickers saying that it's creative commons so that people get to know it and always uh, you you can ask people of course to uh credit the image as you wish this climate outreach project uh, has seven core principles for climate change communication if you would like to know what is worth doing um or what you can communicate from your science let's say they suggest seven core principles 
um, for doing this. So first of all, show real people, um, also show climate change causes at scale, you know, at a smaller scale, how a certain community has suffered or whatever. Also understand your audience. Tell new stories, you know, stories uh, that were left uh, behind because other stories surpassed them, etc. Also show emotionally powerful impacts um, and show local uh, but serious impacts. Uh, also be careful, especially with climate change, uh, because everything is controversial now and everything can be uh, used or objectives uh, very different from the ones we intended at first. So be very careful with your message, your images, uh, you know, your images on the online. Uh, well, actually in any kind of digital environment. I think this is very interesting uh, for you to, to see and, and save actually. Also, this is another example of a project showing the local, uh, showing local impact. We need to remember impact. Um, this is a research project. It's not enough to say, I don't know, if polar bears I, are now suffering, if in our country we don't have polar bears. So we need to consider these, uh, what we need to consider is local impact. This is a project called This Climate Does Not Exist. Um, the Mila Foundation used AI to, you know, generate these images to show these uh, sites and what they would look like if we had, um, I don't know, higher temperatures, if there were floods, etc. Uh, this is, uh, of course, you can check this out with a QR code and you will see that AI was used uh, that AI applied data on fires, floods, pollution, they created this type of image. It's an artistic uh, project, but it has quite a lot of, uh, quite a huge visual impact. And I think it can, it can uh, relate to what you're doing as well. And this is another example. Climate Central, they do something different, but they they show us the before and after. This is in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and they show us what the city would look like before and after uh, a flood, if, you know, the sea levels rose by so many meters or not. And they do this with several cities in the world. You know, showing a, a local image is very important to be able to understand the value of science. These are great examples and, of course, they require resources and funds. Uh, but it's something we would all like to do, actually. But first of all, we need to start with uh, simpler things and then go on to, uh, you know, more complicated projects. Another example of showing the local impact. This is Climate Central again. Here you can see that the mean temperature changes in Los Angeles between 1878 and 2021. I, I knew the, the uh, I was familiar with the global image, but they have decided to do this for, for several cities, for instance. This is Arizona. You can take your data, you know, um, at a given place um, within a given time frame. you can do the same. So this is Arizona, the world, Los Angeles. Uh, there are many more other sites and there's a portal that you can find by scanning this code and they provide, some, you know, filters and hundreds of charts that can be used and that can inspire your work. There are also some new formats. For instance, this is a project conducted at the Cienega de Rinconada Magdalena, which is also a scroll down website that has several multimedia contents, audio, video, images. 
And this is it's a final result of a, a project that took several years and which explains how local communities contributed to scientific knowledge. And that knowledge is very important to, is very useful to fight against the impact of climate change. And I believe this is a great example of communication, of science communication, um, of the joint work of uh, the community and scientists. There is another project. Now they have another project where they explain how small communities can establish this connection between small communities and cities or people from cities and, um, and people from the countryside, how they can connect to share this knowledge and apply it in order to fight climate change. There are also large portals, of course, for, for instance, NASA, where they have uh, uh, millions of communication ideas. This is just an example, okay? So if you can have a look at these huge portals and research sites, I'm sure you will find several uh, ideas to communicate uh, data, events, or results. I know it's very difficult to do something like this, and that's not uh, our aim, but I'm sure you can find some inspiration here. The impact can uh, have several shapes. Have a look at this communication that is very simple and that allows people to work together. And how can we maximize this impact? This is this was work done by uh, political scientist Mariana Ducarque in Brazil. She wrote in the Bolivian portal, Pagina Siete, she wrote about policy, environmental policy degradation in Brazil. And this actually um, um, was, uh, got the reaction of the Brazilian government. So we have the, the, you know, the first, the initial piece of news and the Brazilian government's response. So that actually uh, meant, that's an example of an impact, you know, someone powerful responding to your piece. Another example, Anna Watson from the University of Calgary with Deura Delgado from the Pontificia Universidad Católica from Peru. They wrote about the environmental agenda in the presidential elections in the summer of 2020. It was a local political environmental topic. It, it was a high quality piece. Uh, so actually this, the, the piece was then republished in, in Ecuador, Brazil, and Uruguay. So it reached an amazing audience. So to summarize, three questions. Why is it important to communicate the science we do? Which are the aspects that we need to communicate and how should we communicate them? I hope that these examples uh, are useful and inspiring. I, and I hope you have understood this information. And hopefully they'll be useful uh, for you to have an idea uh, about how to, you know, start uh, doing your own homework and organizing your work uh, at your lab so that you can communicate your work from the lab uh, or, or, you know, whatever your field uh, is. I have, I have also created several free scientific uh, science communication tools, for instance, uh, info verification, uh, image and audio editing software, how to write well in English. You know, these are all useful tools, um, especially when we find uh, barriers in this regard. So um, thank you, everyone. I'm not sure if I have taken too long or not. No, you're doing fine. Okay. Well, then, thank you. I will stop sharing my screen now. I don't know if I have, if there are 45 questions in the chat, or maybe if, if there's something you haven't understood, or if you haven't understood a thing, which I hope is not the case, please let me know. So, um, you know, of course, you can find me on Twitter 
and I'm available to, to help you with anything um, I can. Thank you very much and thank you to Columbia University. Thank you, Juan Manuel. The presentation was uh, amazing because it really shows the importance of science communication uh, towards the general public, the civil society. It's important, you know, to communicate everything we do, our, our research, uh, our papers, why we do what we do. There are many topics that we need to address because these are topics that affect us all when we think about health, climate, the environment, climate change. You know, they uh, have become more important over, with, over the years and they will become more important. I think that the question is, is not if there will be an impact. No, that's not the question. We will need to do this type of work. So let's do this efficiently. So we asked this, uh, we asked ourselves uh, this 20 years ago, should I communicate my, my science? But now that is not the case, okay? Uh, uh, there's no way to stop this. We, we, we're not going back, okay? We, we will not get millennials to stop using the mobiles, okay? You need to, you know, organize your lab. We need, we need to organize our work. We, we should work efficiently with reduced funds or else in 10 years time we'll we'll be doing all this at the last minute you know under a lot of stress and not efficiently when i started working with science communication 23 years ago we kept asking ourselves if communication should be led by journalists or scientists um the, the question has remained but it makes no sense because it's two different things researchers need to do science and that's clear and they need to, if they want to do communication instead of science, that's fine too. However, every scientist needs to communicate more and more, and there's no way around it. Why? Because there are millions of researchers in the in the world, and there are uh, hundreds more institutions in the world as well, maybe thousands more scholarships or, or, or funds. So there is a bottleneck and it will become harder uh, to, you know, stand out, to disseminate what you do. Um, it's like when we started to learn how to program with Python and, or with R, and nowadays there are, I don't know, physicians who are programming, you know? So maybe you like it or not but everything points to the fact that that's where we're going. So, and if we don't communicate and we are in science, you know, uh, we are teachers, but if we don't do this, maybe, you know, someone else will. So it's better if we do it from the areas where we create knowledge, especially by including the civil society in these processes when it comes to uh, knowledge production. Someone said in the chat, it's not just about communication or educating, it's about, you know, involving the population. Yes, several years ago, there was a, uh, something I said, I don't want to say it again, but I said, uh, when Twitter first started, I said that the best thing we can do now to communicate is to stay silent because there was so much noise that, if we're going to listen to everyone, if I need to, you know, give my opinion about everything, it's it's a problem. I didn't want to speak at that time. But now, this is, you know, an ocean of information. And if those of us who know about these things don't speak, it's a problem, okay? It's because we will get an AI speaking for us. So not speaking, I think it's a bit of a cowardly decision. I think we need to talk. And now more than ever, we do have the tools to do so um, in a very clear way. Yes, of course. Well, there are very questions from the participants. Um, so let's begin with the first question. What are we still missing? Uh, regarding 
communication when we understand what authorities need. And this is asked by Jorge Osvaldo Linares Huarzasha. I think what's missing is trying to place scientific information in a specific place and time. For instance, climate change does not provide answers right away or quick answers. These are questions the, of course, this can be answered millions of years from now, but of course, what needs to be done is to limit the general impacts. For instance, when we talk about impact, the sea level rise, uh, how many centimeters would it increase until 2050? Well, what, what does this increase mean? Is it the same in all countries or is it in some regions or in some places? So am I able to filter this information and to provide information on my specific place, uh, country, or will it be different, for instance, here in Colombia? So trying to explain these subtleties it's important. There are many messages that are used invariably by politicians and scientists that lead to even more questions that society asks. For instance, whether the level sea rise will be 50 centimeters. Well, in general terms, it will increase by 50 centimeters. In others, two meters. In others, less. So explaining those small differences and then trying to explain it for each specific context is what uh, provides a more urgent response because decision make politicians from Colombia in Colombia taken from California are useful, but of course the impact would be even higher if the data is specifically on the Pacific Mangler. So perhaps it's too much to ask, but if we have this information, or if there is a link or a connection I can establish with someone, why not? I think that this is needed to relocate the problems. Thank you. Another question also very interesting from Guillermo Soriano. Are there measurements on citizen trust in science in Latin America and on media? How does this impact the strategy to communicate science? And Linares Vega also asks, could you provide an example on how to assess the impact of our communication? Well, regarding the first question, it's extremely important to know, I don't know if this exists, but Spain is the Spanish speaking country that has developed more programs in this regard. Perhaps I'm just saying nonsense with this, but I know the Spanish example more closely. Every uh, year they issue a report on how society sees science, how it views science and the trust they have in science. What media platforms do they use to get informed? How do they check the information? I know that Colombia has this as well, a report that is not programmed to be issued annually. And I know that in Argentina, a similar system also uh, takes place, but the social impact of science in every country is extremely important in order to understand how people get informed on science. This is key. And I think that this should be financed every year so that a report can be issued annually on each society, because yes, we know that we would then know, for instance, if every year more people are using smartphones than laptops, then most formats will be adapted to smartphones. Users are using smartphones more than laptops in general, or even uh, now TikTok is uh, more popular than Twitter, uh, Facebook. So we should adapt the format. We can adapt the length of the format. We can be focused more on these two components and then we can already select what data we select we include and what we don't we disregard so imagine if we had information every year what we could do at 
each university, we can adapt the communications plan to each region, to each province, to what the data is showing us so that we can establish this. And what about the example? What was the example from the second question? Yeah, if you can provide an example on how to assess the impact of our communication. Well, this is very important, but this uh, you have to decide for yourselves because 10 years ago, what had the highest, biggest impact was how many retweets we had or how many people was following me on Twitter. That was the metric used. But now we have many more tools available to know whether something that we produce is having a bigger impact or not. The number of conversations that are around a a Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn post is very high, and algorithms are favoring these sort of publications and posts. If there is much discussion around a given post, then we can say that the content has been successful. The algorithm would think in the same way. And so platforms are uh, of a misinformation are very uh, successful because uh, we always have comments on our publications and that grabs the attention even more. The number of interactions created is important to be borne in mind. And in order to start, there are systems to measure uh, payment systems that are not worth it for labs, I think, because the number of times a content is shared is important to know this. And also to have statistics or numbers on how much did it cost for me to create that content. It would be very useful if we could understand how much we've spent on creating a given content. And for the lab, that's very useful because if this creates this amount of interactions, then we can create this type of content within our group. If a website such as the one uh, of uh, the example I gave you, uh, it has had a great impact, but we can do this only a few times. So how to measure impact has to help us decide which content we design and the type of content that will be more efficient given our characteristics. Uh, we're not Steven Spielberg ourselves and we're not video makers. I, I, I'm not, I'm not an expert on audio either, audio visual, but if someone is very good at Twitter, then well, that's great. And then other people can be very good at designing uh, infographics. That's an excellent uh, presentation model. Other people are much better creating technical reports and measuring the interaction uh, every time uh, a media platform calls you for an interview well that's having impact and every time something is shared it's you can know this also it's easy to know excellent thank you well we have more questions there's another question from guillermo barrenichea the needs for journalism or media are representative of what society needs to receive from scientists. How, how do you see this? What are your what's your input on that? Well, sometimes there are news that are relevant or there are needs, but of course they might be different from what the scientists can give. So how do we communicate climate change? Do we discuss this from the point of view of collapse or giving hope of the climate situation? Well, everything that you're mentioning, for example, has the characteristic of uh, scientific journalism is journalism. It's, it's like all other types of journalism and Journalism is different from communication, but scientific journalists ask questions of what is being done at the moment. So journalism is a weapon of power and can be a weapon that can uh, align those who are using that power, such as institutes. So a scientific journalist needs to be able to question 
the scientists. There are many ethical issues included in this component. For instance, with animals or in Latin America, there are many issues that have to do with science and they are communicated as with any other branch of journalism. So scientific journalism is like any other type of journalism. We just discuss scientific matters, but it's journalism. And the ethical issues of this profession, maybe that's what the question is addressing. The calling the grabbing the attention with a headline that mm, it speaks of scandal is that ethical of course it will grab the attention more but this is the dichotomy of journalism many of the journalists i've worked with or that i've seen working with scientists uh, the journalist writes an incredible post and the scientist leaves this or her ego aside and says that it can be understood by the layperson but then the editor because of someone changes the headline and becomes, for instance, this new medicine of uh, a given university can cure cancer of uh, a specific kind. So that's why we need to have uh, a clear definition of things because the say th this can then happen when we're talking about basic science products, not even trials. We are already speaking of, of official drugs. So journalists need to create that impact to grab the attention and science does not need it to be so. If they, journalists have more of a say, it's this, this situation is very complex, but I think that is positive that there are more tools available to fight against this kind of information. There are many more ways we can check information, AI that can be misused, but can also be used correctly to check information that has been said by a given person to check whether that piece of information from the Ministry of Environment from Chile is accurate, uh, uh, correct or not, and whether this has is backed up by scientists. But of course, journalism has always been based on grabbing the attention from readers and viewers, and there were excellent columnists. Now there are many more columnists and um, media through uh, newsletters has highlighted the existence of columnists or opinion columns as the uh, the holders of the true information. So this uh, leads people to identify a given opinion columnist and uh, consider them as the uh, authentic source of information. This is a serious problem, but we are facing it anyway. And so there are many more tools uh, that can be used for negative purposes, but there are also many more tools available to fight against this. All of these uh, ways to check information are being supported by media and institutions, and they can be a good solution. And it's it would be ideal if many, uh, most scientists could become part of this network. because we can we can just uh, disregard fake news or so everyone's voice has value and this would be very helpful and regarding what you were saying uh, by answering the question on massimo palme how to discredit fake news on social media or to get in a debate with negationist groups and how, what's the best way to deal with this with a given population for instance one of the main challenges is how to get informed through reliable sources there are many sources and we have to select the sources of information that are the most reliable uh to and also as scientists the ones that will be more reliable to communicate our content so the question was how to make, how do we discredit fake news or to even uh, ignore this kind of, of news? Well, 
ignoring or just uh, disregarding altogether fake news. In my Twitter bubble, for instance, people do not retweet fake information, fake news, or does not cite the tweet itself, but takes a print screen and, and um, shows uh, how how this fake news is, is going around. So this is not encouraging the dissemination and sharing this post or, or providing more attention to the person who's shared it. Well, there's a subtleties or characteristics to each social media platform, but ignoring it altogether will create two universe, two different uh, contexts, one that promotes this and the other one that ignores it. And this separation is needed, but of course it will be problematic because many people will be on the other group. My, my mother, for example, she, uh, many people can be in uh, misinformed um, Twitter bubbles. In the end, political decisions from a country have to take into account citizens' opinions. I now live in Italy and there's a concern that um, a right extreme right wing party will be getting to power. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a, a wise call to segregate those who, who say this because they're part of society. And so there are methods to know that for each platform we make less noise and this can be done on twitter but at, but at the end of the day we need to be empathetic and develop tools that can be empathetic for those who do not think in the same way as we do not just in a digital universe but also in a, a, a public library if there is one someone who um considers this to be a hoax then we also need to listen because they are part of society. And at some point, there will be more people who are convinced that this type of information has no use, especially if it's not justified by research. But it's this leads me to the second part of how to choose the source of information. Who should we trust? I have sources of information that I consider to be reliable. Other people might uh, think differently. And in my, uh, where I have more influence in my immediate circle, well, I can communicate what I, what I think and people tr might trust me, but that's as far as I go. And I try not to make mistakes so that what I say has truth behind it. And if I am not sure about something, then uh, I just don't say it so that people can continue to rely on me as a source of information. Because if they trust me, then they will believe in what I say. And the ethical component always brings us back to this. We all have the job of understanding that we are scientists but we're not superior to anybody and our status can actually be removed we can lose this because of a mistake that we make but we also need to be careful with what we say and make sure that we remain silent when we're not sure to manage our sources and to create that trust and that we can maintain it over time so that we continue to grow in this sense. I don't need to recruit anybody or have followers because I don't need to attract a, an audience. I just need to communicate what is truthful and I need to disseminate data that is accurate. And then people will decide on whether they trust me. And this takes much time. This can take years to build, but If we've been working in this way for decades, then, well, that will be the result. And depending on how many mistakes we make along the way. Apologies about my curse word, but sometimes that's just the way it goes. 
So we have a few minutes left. We are going to move on to two more questions. One is from Fanny Ramos. Social media have played a role, but there are populations where we cannot access these platforms. And for this, we need more time, money, energy. How plausible do you consider research agencies and governments, as well as other organizations, to invest what is needed to have more efficient communication? That's very clear. Many times we talk about digital communications and some people don't even have an internet connection. Uh, but curiously enough, uh, it's the opposite in Africa. Uh, the mobile network is much better in Africa. And many epidemiologists know this. And the use of mobile phones has been very active for 20 years, you know? So people... Uh, you know, get their information on their mobiles, maybe, you know, what is uh, valid, valid, true for Latin America is not true for Africa, and the opposite. And maybe this can change in, in the next few years, you know, the connection can change and we people can have access to, um, to this type of information. We need to, you know, maybe keep printing information, uh, you know, old school style and we need to work with local communities. It's very important to do this. We need to uh, find, uh, to select the audience we want. And this is a great example of an audience. S scientific research is usually done at the in capital cities and then they get to provinces. Dorian. Eso. Y entonces, el, eh, el, sí, la investigación científica se hace desde la capital. Se va so, a... scientific research is done uh, in the capital, then it goes to, you know, local communities, but then you, you go and ask a local fisherman uh, or someone like that, and we go talk to them, and they don't know about the information. And that's changing now. We need to work with local people. We need to persuade authorities so that they do that. How is this done? I have no idea. I have no idea about many things, but it is true that we need to uh, prioritize this type of audience. Uh, I was saying the general public, but that, that's too abstract as a concept, because how can we communicate to the general public? Who is the general public? Is that tweeting? Is it my mom? Is it my neighbor? Uh, and it's also, you know, the place where I am conducting my research. It's the, I don't know, the indigenous people that live uh, in, uh, in the area where I'm working, for instance, and the ones that are helping me. I think that if we find our target audience, it's much easier. We need to talk to our communities, you know, the community that will come to you for a month and then tell them about the, the research, the results, and how this is going to impact them. This is something every scientist does when writing their project, but they do this for themselves. I think that we sh scientists, and this is not easy, but scientists should have this you know, superpower of imagination. It's very difficult to picture yourself and what you're going to be doing. Esto y esto, que recojamos esto y tratemos de dejar esto. Do this. Cuando and what will happen when we go back to the community, will we go back, etc. And I think in this case, uh, uh, Americans are much more pragmatic in that regard. If they say, okay, no one helps us in the local community, we'll do it ourselves. And in Latin America, it is different. So I don't have an answer for that, but that question is really important. And we need to focus on these target audiences. The questions are great. They're very difficult. Muchísimas más. Yo cobro por, por respuesta. Yes, there are many more questions. You know, I charge per question. Okay. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna become a millionaire then. I doubt it. There are several questions that we can then forward to Juan, and we can share with all of you as well. Uh, but just to summarize, you know. Uh, to go overview the more practical uh, items. Many times we don't have enough time 
within our work in, uh, to know how to communicate better, how we can, I don't know, summarize an article and share some highlights with a, a, broad, a broader audience. So if you had to make two recommendations, what would you say? We need to explain evidence in, in a short time. We have a captive audience and they pay attention for five seconds, okay? So you, you need to um, attract people's attention for five seconds. How do we explain a, a scientific paper or um, how do we explain it to the general audience in five seconds through a, an Instagram post or Facebook post, LinkedIn post? What, what would you recommend? Well, this is a skill that you acquire over time. Nobody is a, a good writer by birth. Maybe Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, or maybe Neruda, okay? Not many people. And I think it's a skill you learn with time. If you need to communicate your science, I think that you need to focus on the impact of your research, okay? When, if I, if I were to ask these 100 and something participants, if I were to ask them, can you please tell me about your research? They will start by uh, posing the question they asked themselves. But uh, those who study business administration and economics, they, you know, they, they use this elevator pitch uh, technique. You meet uh, uh, the company CEO, for instance, in a lift, in an elevator and you only have 20 seconds and you have a business model you want to share with this person and try and do this. They focus on that. I think that science schools should consider this and, and teach us how to communicate in the same way as lawyers learn to communicate and learn to be objective and learn to you know, not be biased in the judgment. I think scientists should also learn to do, to do this. And I will start by doing that. Forget about the question, your research question. Think about the impact that the research will have or the impact you found, even if it has nothing to do with your research aims. But if you found that uh, maybe at the Rio uh, Parana River, there was a paper published by the IAI you know, the dams were closed. And when that happened, the, the fishing communities, you know, it was very few families, but they lost their jobs um, so th because there was no more water. And the idea was to investigate the, the water levels to, to prevent those dams from closing. Uh, and that's an impact that they didn't know, okay? And we realized that these people, you know, now are out of a job. They had to leave the countryside and they're now living under a bridge in the city. So focus on the impact, okay? Focus on that. Also, we need to remember that communicating science uh, many times does not involve talking about what you've done. I write many newspaper um, media articles about medicine, science, but also technology. And, you know, media articles are documents that include technical aspects such as, you know, funders, participating organizations, people. And many times this is not included in a newspaper article, but I need to include them in this case. So to do this, I need to, you know, tell a different story. You know, tell, I mean, it doesn't focus on the research. Maybe it's something parallel. I don't know, someone who died um, during the research. Maybe there was mercury intoxication because they were, uh, I don't know, doing something with the lands and the crops, you know, or whatever. I think that those stories, it's not that they call people's attention, but they do have an impact. And I think it's very important to, uh, to really uh, focus on that and rethink it. And also try and attend as many writing courses as possible. Writing well is not easy. 
and for and scientists need to develop these skills. Please uh, take writing courses. Many PhDs and doctors write uh, very poorly, okay? It's not a skill we are trained in, okay? Many people start university and they think they know how to write and they don't. We're not good writers. I'm not a good writer and I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm now better, but if possible, attend a writing course. If writing is not your thing, maybe attend um, uh, a speaking uh, course so that you can have you know, a decent podcast, for instance. Uh, if you prefer video materials, may attend a course on how to make video materials. Well, Juan Manuel, uh, we have run out of time. Please uh, share your Twitter with us, Juan Sarasua. Juan Sarasua, yes, I'll include this here in the chat. Yes, so that we can all follow you. Thank you so much for this amazing uh, lesson. It was an amazing uh, presentation. And hopefully we'll keep talking to you in the future about these relevant topics. I'm, I'm, I love doing this type of thing and hopefully I'll be able to help you in the future as well. And this is my tweet, my Twitter. Thank you, everyone. We'll meet again on Tuesday when we have the next session. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Juan Manuel. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.